Okay, today is Monday, uh, September 14th, and uh, the lecture today, uh, this is ECE 641, uh, model-based imaging, and, uh, uh, or, and what we're going to be covering today is 2D uh, non-causal models, uh, 2D uh, non-causal models for images, which is really the most common kind of way you model images, because causal models for images are a little bit odd, uh, have uh, because of their asymmetry, anisotropy. Isotropy means rotational invariance, right? So, a um, uh, for the 2D causal. Uh, the problem is, is that you end up having to take these pixels, and and you you predict you predict this pixel given those those okay, and um, and then uh, uh, the prediction the prediction error uh, is going to be white in that case, assuming that uh, well okay. Um, if this is the minimum mean square error estimate of this pixel given all the past pixels, then the prediction error will be white. If it's not, if you haven't used all the past pixels, uh, then if, if you're using, if it's a suboptimal predictor, then your prediction isn't as good as it could be and there'll be some leakage of information and then the prediction errors won't be perfectly white. So if you have, if you could, but if you assume that with a, a, this is a, a what I call p equals one order predictor. If you assume with an order p predictor that you can achieve the minimum mean square error estimate of the pixel given all the past, then you call this 2D AR. AR means autoregressive. So, you know. Real physical signals can never be perfectly modeled this way, right? Because in a real physical system, well, you know, generally speaking, because there'll be, uh, you, you could expect that you keep more and more dependency. If you took a real image, if you use more pixels, you, get, you keep getting a little bit better predictor. But often what you do is you sort of approximate it as being order P A R, because you don't want, uh, the complexity of the model become too large. As this prediction window gets bigger and bigger, it becomes more and more difficult to, to estimate all the parameters in the model. So, so, uh, so that's fine. Now the problem is then this model won't be isotropic. So there'll be a natural orientation to the behaviors of the image because of the fact that you're doing the scan in a raster order, which in intuitively will create some kind of streaking structure in the, in the image, right? So, um, so the question is, can you get away from causality? Uh, so, uh, so, uh, so for images, so I'll put here four images. Causality is not natural. Okay, it's not natural, right? So, uh, so we'd like to get away from that. So, so we can have one D uh, non-causal. Okay, so what happens is you have samples in one day. So let's take uh, P equals one. So you take this pixel and you take that pixel. Everything to me is a pixel. And you predict that sample using a combination of these two, uh, these two pixels. Or maybe four pixels. You know, you could use a larger window. So you could do it like this. You can do it like this. This is P equals two, okay? So now what happens is that you have the conditional, oh, so now we have a concept of the neighborhood. Okay, a neighborhood uh, so for some pixel J, S of J uh, is going to be equal to 
uh, j minus p to j minus 1, then j plus 1, j plus p. OK? All right, so you'll have two p neighbors. And um, so, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't write this correctly. I'll use this notation a lot. I use this partial thing in sub j, so those are the neighbors of j. Okay, and uh, so that's a neighborhood. So neighborhood, neighbor, hood, properties are that, uh, first of all, for all i and j, um, partial uh, uh, j is a member of partial i, oh, partial i, if and only if i is a member of partial j. In other words, neighbor, neighbor, being a neighbor is a symmetric property. If I'm your neighbor, you're my neighbor. Notice that that's a little different than what we were doing for the causal case. For the causal case, um, I never used the word neighborhood, actually. So you had a pixel, maybe the pixel before it, you're using to predict it. But it's not a neighborhood property because, so you use it like this, right? So you use this pixel to predict that. So you could say that this is a neighbor of that, but the problem is that is not a neighbor of this because the, the prediction is only done causally. So it's not symmetric. This is symmetric. That's an important property. So if I say neighborhood, I mean a symmetric. It's essentially come, what it's really going to be is an um, undirected graph, OK? So whereas the other things are directed graph. And then um, uh, I is not a neighbor of itself, OK? And I guess that's it. So those are neighborhood properties, OK? So fine. So now, now what we can do is we can say, OK, uh, um, OK, we say, oh, uh, definition. I should really tell them, I don't actually know who you'd even ask, but this lights out, right? OK. Um, definition, we say that, uh, so let's say, say we have x, y, and z, OK? So we say, we say um, uh, how am I going to do this? Um, we say that uh, uh, we say that z is conditionally independent of x given y. If, when I say if in this context, by the way, this is a definition. So in a definition, if means if and only if, OK? Um, if what? If the probability of, um, oh, I don't want to make this too complicated. So I'm trying to try, I guess I could take some shortcuts, because the problem is if I make it too complicated. Can I just write it down like this? Here's, these are, these are var random variables. We know that random variables don't always have densities, OK? So for me to write it down in the general case, I ha it's going to require a little additional notation. But I'll just pretend they have densities, and we all know what we mean, OK? Uh, then I'll, I'll write that. Then what you're saying is that, the conditional density of z, so I'm doing exactly what I told you never to do, okay? Uh, which is I'm d doing the, I'm using the variable of the argument to specify the function, okay? Which is like you're not supposed to do that. But it's okay to do things that are wrong once you know they're wrong, maybe. 
Maybe that's not true. I don't know, okay? <laughs> but you know what I mean. It's okay to take a shortcut uh, as long as you know exactly that you're taking the shortcut and it's not creating too much ambiguity. But it's not really right. Like, I wouldn't write this in the formal notes, okay? Uh, y and z is equal to, oh, y and x is equal to uh, uh, the probability density function of y. So we say that um, another way of putting it is that, uh, um, yeah, so in other words, uh, so another way of putting it is that, um, okay, if, if two random variables are independent, Okay, this is a little. If two random variables, so if x is independent of y, okay, that means independent. Then the probability distribution of x and y together is the probability density of x times the probability density of y, right? Everybody knows that. Okay, so, so and, and furthermore, then the conditional probability density of x given y is equal to the probability density of x, okay? So if, if things are independent, then if you condition on them, it doesn't matter. It doesn't give you any in information, right? So I could prove this by just you know, uh, using the definition here. Okay? But it's intuitively obvious, right? If two things are independent, one thing doesn't give you any information about the other. So it's den it's conditional density doesn't depend on y because they're independent, right? So what this is saying is that the, that the conditional density of z given x and y together is only dependent upon y. So it looks like z is independent of x. So the question is, is z independent of x? In general? No. In general, no. So why? Because here's what's happening. You have x. By the way, this is why I think it's so useful taking this course, okay? The specific things you learn, I mean, they're all great too, right? But this is just sort of generally how to think about problems. So it's useful for all th kinds of things. You got a connection like this. So x affects y, y affects z. But the, so is x and z, are they independent? No. It's just that if you know why, all the information, all the way, the, sort of the totality of how x affects z is all through y. So it's as if you have, like, this shows up a lot in physical systems, right? This would be like, this person talks to this person, x called y on the telephone, then y called z on the telephone. So the only information that x got to z was through y. So if I know y, I know everything about what x uh, told z, right? So we say that, it's con that, that z is conditionally independent of x given y. That doesn't mean it's independent. In fact, it may be very highly correlated, OK? This also shows up um, in a lot of uh, scientific or experimental situations because you're trying to figure out, uh, you, often you're trying to figure out causality, which is an entirely, a very deep and unclear area of uh, causality. Um, because, um, you know, because whenever you're writing a scientific paper, particularly like in the, uh, in the social sciences or in, uh, not exactly social science, it doesn't quite capture it, but uh, like if you're doing NIH-related research on like drug efficacy, say, um, maybe particularly because of the fact that when you're dealing with people, there's a lot of things you can't do because of ethics, right? Whereas if you're doing an experiment, sometimes it comes up in experiments too, but if you're doing experiments, you can do, you know, it's easier to control the situation. With uh, people, there's a lot of additional constraints, right? So it's often, so people will say, oh, look, people who have big feet get lung cancer a lot, okay? So, uh, which actually, I'm pretty sure is true, okay? <laughs> Okay, so because, well, at least it used to be true. It may not be true now because, um, 
because you know, on average, men have larger feet than women, say, and that uh, you know, men the rate of lung cancer was higher among men or something because they smoke more. That might not be true anymore, but at one time it was true. But it's obviously not informative. Okay, it's somehow irrelevant intuitively. Okay, so so the point is that. Okay, don't quote me on that, because it's possible I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's true, actually. Carla Broadley told me that. The, um, I believe it. It sounds plausible, even if it's not true, okay? Well, it's not that I believe it, but you know what I mean, okay? It sounds like a good story, okay? But um, the point is that you can have these ridiculous, if you start, it, it, there's a huge difference between correlation and what they call causation, okay? When I say what they call causation, it's because they don't really have a definition for what it is. It's just something they talk about, and we all think we understand, but we really don't, okay? But, uh, okay, but there's this idea that certain things cause other things, okay? And uh, so just finding a correlation between two things doesn't really tell you which causes the other. And the idea of causality is that, well, you know, you change this thing and it would change that. Somehow, if you can make people's feet bigger, you wouldn't expect them to suddenly get cancer, okay? But, uh, but you know, so the point is, is that that thing is being caused by some third thing, okay? Okay, and um, so, uh, yeah, and actually the graph structure there is a little different. You have x, x causes y, which causes z, okay? Huh, it's not really different. Here's the reason why, okay? And this is sort of the mind-blowing fact, which you'll probably just assume that isn't true because it'll be too distorting for your brain. That in um, mathematics, uh, or at least in probability, uh, the idea of causality is uh, very suspicious because if you have, you might say, oh, x causes y, right? So you have the probability of y given x, and then you have the probability of x, right? Except for Bayes' rule allows you to reverse that at any time you choose. So you go, can go the other direction. You just you apply Bayes' rule, you get probability of x given y, and the way you do that is you just take probability of y given x times probability of x over the probability of y, right? And then the probability of x and y together is the probability of x given y times the probability of y. So Bayes' rule allows you to reverse the direction of any arrow of dependency. So mathematically, you really can't say that one random variable create caused the other there's no way to distinguish. And you say, oh, well, OK. Well, obviously, it's a really fundamental problem, OK? Which, as far as I'm concerned, has never really been addressed. But uh, so, so you can reverse causality. So, so, uh, so here, x is conditionally independent of z given y, but I mean, sorry, z is conditionally independent of x given y, and, but uh, x is conditionally independent of z given y also. And actually, even in this example I just gave you, I'm going off a little bit on a tangent, that if you have like this, this is, say, x, y, and z, you can actually reverse the arrows Okay, and you can get any uh, any uh, this. It's equivalent to this structure, actually. Okay, because uh, I won't go into the details. These are called Bayesian networks, by the way. Okay, but anyway, so okay, so it's important to understand this idea of uh, conditional independence. So um, so what happens is that we say that. Uh, uh, so we'll assume, so this thing is a Gaussian Markov, okay, a Gaussian, oops, Gaussian Markov random, random field, 
Okay, so it's a GMRF. I'll talk about these a lot. And you'll say, wow, there's a lot of words up there that I don't know why you're using. Like, okay, Gaussian, you know, Markov, uh, we haven't talked about that. Random, well, you know what that is. Field, hmm. Well, if you knew what it was, uh, we're kind of misusing it anyway. Field actually is a term that's used to, rec uh, to refer to like an image, uh, a 2D array of uh, values, right? But, um, but we're going to use it in one dimension, okay? So a Gaussian mark of random field. So X is a GMRF if the conditional distribution of Xn given Xk for k not equal to n, so in other words, you take one value and you look at this conditional distribution given all the other values in, the, in, the, in here. So this would be like Xn. You'd be asking, well, what's the conditional distribution of Xn given all the other values? Right? That it only depends on P of Xn given X, its neighbors. Okay, so, so um, Xn is a gauss markov random field. If, uh, if the conditional distribution of every value, so this is true, if, is a, if for all n, this is true. Okay, so every pixel is only dependent upon uh, its neighbors. Okay, and the neighborhood structure has to have the structure I just described. Yeah. Only immediate neighbors or all the second degree neighbors are complex. I'm sorry. Could you say that? Speak a little slower, because you know it's a little funny when people have their masks on. It's hard to understand them, <laughs> both because the sound gets a little muffled, but also because I can't see their lips moving. So you're imagining it as a graph, right? And so let's pick X N. Are you talking about only the immediate neighbors? So in 2D, so I'm being vague here a little bit because I'm not specifying with dimensionality. In fact, it can be a general graph, okay? So I'm doing kind of the general case first a little bit. But that's okay because you have the notes which you read, okay? So you'll get different perspectives on how I'm covering it, right? Which is not bad. But here, uh, here in the case of the neighbors of N, uh, I said it's going to be like N minus P to n minus 1, n plus 1, n plus p, right? So that's 1D, OK? But in 2D, and I'll cover 2D and 1D together. How's that? You might do something like this. So this is p equals 1, right? So you do all the pixels within uh, this uh, neighborhood, OK? And um, uh, obviously, you can make p bigger, right? Now, but the critical factor is that for all i and j, i is a member of a neighbor of j if and only if j is a neighbor of i. You've got to have that. If you don't have that, you're going to have problems, OK? It's not, I mean, I can make this definition, but there may not be anything that meets the constraint or anything interesting that meets the constraint, right? So it's going to turn out we need this, OK? So this is part of the definition of this, OK? Did I answer your question, or, uh, or do you want to ask it again? I feel like I maybe didn't quite exactly answer. X is the neighbor of y. Y is the neighbor of z. Yes. So I'm talking about the leftmost graph there. Oh, here. OK, so let's apply it on this particular case. So in your definition, x and z are not neighbors, right? That is? X, oh, I haven't even defined neighborhood here. This was just for the purposes of defining conditional independence as a concept, OK? OK, so here I have, I have a neighborhood, right? I define a neighborhood. In order to have a thing called a Markov random field, you have to have a thing called a neighborhood. You have to have a neighborhood. So you start off by defining the neighborhood, and you say, with that neighbor, so if I say something in the Markov random field, 
it's sort of actually not that informative. Because everything is in Markov hand if, you're, if I make the neighbors everything. So if everything is a neighbor of everything, then everything's a Markov random field. Okay, where a Gaussian Markov, or Gaussian Markov random field, we're also going to generalize this to Markov random fields, but as it's any Gaussian random field would be a Gaussian Markov random field if I make the neighborhood everything. But generally, I don't want to make the neighborhood everything. I make, I define some set of neighbors, okay, and then subject to that definition, it's a Gaussian a Markov random field. So technically, I say X is a Gaussian neighbor, Markov random field with neighborhood um, like that, right? So that's the neighborhood. Uh, and that's the Gauss marker around the field, OK? So that's just a definition right now, OK? But you feel OK with that? Does that feel comfortable? And intuitively, what it means is that if you have this, this OK, in 1D, it means this pixel is only dependent upon some neighbor, a, a number of neighboring pixels. In 2D, it means that this pixel is only dependent upon some region of neighboring pixels, right? Now, does that mean that this pixel is independent of pixel outside the neighborhood? Not necessarily. Typically not. For the same reason that are X and Z independent? No, they're only conditionally independent. So why do we have this idea of a Markov random field? We do it because it's a way of simplifying things, right? The problem is we have a Gaussian Markov random field, and we allow it to be any Gaussian Markov random field. That's really complicated, because if there's an image, it's got a million pixels in it, the covariance matrix for that is, is a million squared. So there's a roughly a million squared over two parameters, OK? So there's a lot of parameters. So that's hard to deal with. So you want to make some sort of simplifications. So you make the simplification that there's some locality of interaction, OK? So this is a loca localization uh, assumption that this pixel is conditionally independent of pixels out here, given some neighbors, OK? OK, so that's a Markov random field. Okay, Now, it's a Gaussian Markov random field. So if we make that assumption, uh, where does it lead us, OK? That's the next thing. OK, so we want to find out something. OK, so what's happened? What happens, OK? So well, first of all, I'd like to point out some things. Assume without loss of generality that the expected value of x is equal to 0, OK? So uh, we're going to always assume. Just always assume that x, the expected value of everything is 0, OK? Because unless I specifically say otherwise, because it's usually an easier case to handle. And it's easy enough, because you just subtract off the expected value, whatever it is, and then it's expected value 0, and you deal with that, OK? So then, uh, then uh, the conditional, so this is, gal uh, the conditional distribution has got to be Gaussian, right? So that means the conditional distribution of xn given xk for uh, k not equal to n, right? So this is like the non-causal conditional distribution. That Well, first of all, it's got to have the form 1 over z times the exponential of minus 1 half. Um, this is 1 over sigma, say, n squared, right, uh, times, um, uh, this is going to be uh, uh, xn minus, now this thing here uh, is going to be the conditional expectation, this thing has to be the conditional expectation of xn given xk for k for k not equal to n. 
OK, maybe I lost you there. OK, let me go a little slower. OK, okay so this is the conditional distribution of a sample given all the other, given a pixel given all the other pixels. And I'm assuming everything's Gaussian. So that's it. this is a scalar value. It's got to be Gaussian, right? Because that's the whole thing's Gaussian. But this isn't the marginal distribution of Xn. It's the conditional distribution. So whatever, the, it's a Gaussian random variable. Everything's zero mean, OK? So the conditional expectation of this thing, given everything else, is going to be the conditional mean of that, right? It's almost like what I just said was, sometimes things are so simple that they're hard to say, <laughs> OK? But the, what is the conditional expectation of the mean? What's the conditional mean of xn given all the other pixels? Well, it's the conditional expectation of xn given all the other pixels. Does that seem clear? So whatever that is, that's what fits here. I mean, let me write it down. I'll put xn hat. It's not really saying anything, but it makes you feel better, maybe. Because it's the expected value. Don't fill in the xn hat quite yet, because I'm going to write out the, a more general expression for it in just a moment. Okay? I just put that there to make you feel better. Okay? Because this xn hat has to be a function of all these other pixels. Is, are people, is that clear? OK, now, and then whatever its variance is, it's something. And the mean is 0 otherwise. The mean has just got to be a, oh, it's just whatever. OK, that's this. OK, now, the key idea is that this conditional expectation of xn given xk for k not equal to n is equal to y. Well, it's got to be, a, everything's zero mean, so it's got to be a linear function of the other pixels because everything's Gaussian. When thing, everything's Gaussian, OK, this is my, oh, I'm allowed to write just little meandering thoughts over here, right? Um, this is my, my, spat, my scratch area, OK? Uh, so if we have x and y are zero mean, and Gaussian. And whenever I write Gaussian, I mean jointly Gaussian, OK? Then you know that the conditional expectation of x given y has got to have the form what? So this is the expectation. x and y, by the way, could be vectors here, OK? So the conditional expectation of x given y always has to have what form? It's a function of y, yes. And what, because this is Gaussian, what function does it have to be? It has to be, excuse me? Well, this is a function, a Gaussian isn't a function. Yeah, no. <laughs> I mean, you're in the right track. It's got to be linear. It's got to be linear. And this is the most general linear function for some a. I don't know what a is, right? It's whatever. It's something, right? Everybody's got that? So whenever you have Gaussian random variables, the minimum least square error expectation of one Gaussian random variable given in another has got to be a linear function, right? If it's not Gaussian, it could be a nonlinear function. But it's got to be a linear function, OK? So I can write that. It becomes the sum over j of a i j y j. Right? Because that's what it means. Is everybody OK with that? It's the little things that really are important. Yes? Is that true because they're Gaussian? Like, yes. Really true. Okay. It's true because they're Gaussian, huh? It wouldn't work for other, just for me. Not in general. Okay. I mean, you could always cook up an example of a non-Gaussian thing that had a linear estimate. But usually, if things are not Gaussian, in the general case, it's like if I you know, toss a bunch of puzzle pieces and they hit the floor, chances are they won't assemble themselves into the jigsaw puzzle, right? But it could happen. Right. 
<laughs> so in the general case, it won't be a linear function unless they're Gaussian, okay? Very important idea. In fact, let's just sit here and reflect on that just a bit because it's a really important concept. Any, any other thoughts? It's a small class, so if you want to share your thoughts, it's like Mathematics Anonymous, right? You could just... <clears throat> I, my name is Charles Bowman, and I like probability. Okay. All right, okay? So it's a linear function, so we put the linear function in here. This, so the most general case is it's got to be a linear function, right? So it's the sum over k not equal to n, uh, we'll say h n k x k. So that's the most general form, okay? I could plug it in here. And this has got to be a square there. Oh, it's got to be a square. You know why there has to be a square, right? Because that's just the form of the Gaussian. And this is the conditional expectation. So over here, this box, this box here is computing the sum over k not equal to n of h n k x k, okay? And that's the predictor, and then uh, this would be x hat n. It's the non-causal predictor, okay? Now, the interesting thing is this. Um, oh, uh, uh, okay. I should have used a g here, because in the notes, I always use a g. I use an h for the... Uh, the causal predictor, and I always use a G for the non-causal predictor. So this should have been a G. I'm, I apologize. Okay? Now, okay, so, actually, let me just do this. Laptop. So here you go. This is it. So this is the conditional distribution of Xn given Xi. If this is a Gauss-Markov random field, it will turn out that, that this isn't dependent on all the other axes. It's only dependent on the neighboring axes. That's just kind of an assumption. Usually when you're modeling data, if you're modeling data, the data is never a Gaussian-Markov random field. It's never, it's never a causal Gaussian Markov ran the field. It's never a non-causal non Gaussian 2D Gaussian. It's never any of those things because it's never a random field because a pizza is not a random variable, okay? It's just not. And what is true is you model it with that, okay? So it's not true. You can't make a statement like it's either true or false that the thing is a causal Markov random field because it's, or a non-causal Markov random field because it's not a marker of random field. It's not random, <laughs> okay? Uh, so, you know, you have to be careful about those statements. Those statements are silly, okay? Uh, but what you can say is that you can say certain things about mathematical objects you construct, okay? And then you can ask what properties they have mathematically. And from those properties, you can try to determine whether they would be good choices or bad choices to model real data. Okay, now, so now this is the conditional distribution of a pixel given all the other pixels, or a sample given all the other samples. But now what will end up happening is if, if this is a gas marker in the field, then it won't be dependent on all the other pixels. It'll only be dependent on a certain number of neighboring ones, right? So let's say, so in that case, it can't, so let's say this was only dependent on xn minus one and xn plus one. So the two neighbors. So then, then it can't depend on xn plus 2. It can't depend on that, right? 
So if that's the case, what does that tell you about G? Yeah, it's got to be zero outside of those points, right? So it's only non-zero for the neighbors. In fact, actually, the really technically true thing is that it's always zero for non-neighbors, right? For a neighbor, it could still be zero, but in general, it's not zero. So it's always zero. So if you look at G, you can tell what the neighbors are because the neighbors are the ones for which G is not zero. Now, okay, so is everybody okay with that? I'd like to go through this like slowly enough. First of all, you're reading the notes, right? Because if you read the notes, then when I come to the class, I'm just kind of reviewing the intuition behind it. And then it reinforces it. But you gotta go through a read of the notes. You might say, well, I read the notes, I don't understand them, okay? That's okay, read them, at least read them and don't understand them, okay? Because that's a step. You, before you can understand something, you have to be confused about it first, okay? So read them and don't understand it, but then we'll talk about it in class, you'll at least have the, some of the basic ideas in your brain, okay? So, uh, So that's one way of looking at it. Understanding things, I think, I don't know, this is my current hypothesis. What does it mean to understand something? I don't really know, but here's one way I'm thinking about. It. Understanding something means you have more than one way of getting to it, right? Like, like the, if you only have like one way to get from one idea to another, you don't really feel like you understand it, right? It's like, uh, I don't know, I used to be from Philadelphia. I, I, was, I was born in Philadelphia. Well, I grew up in, around Philadelphia. I went to school in Philadelphia. I used to know Philadelphia. I'm sure if I went back there now, I wouldn't know it very well anymore. But there was a time when I felt like I knew Philadelphia, okay? Because I felt like if I had to get somewhere, I could get lost, but I could always find my way back because I knew it. I understood the layout of the city, right? <laughs> so that's what it means to understand something in my view. So you need to have more than one way of looking at it. So this is one way of looking at it, right? Another way of looking at it is up here. If it's a Gaussian random, Markov, if it's a Gaussian random field, then I know I can write down the probability distribution like this, because I can write down the probability distribution like that for any Gaussian random field, right? Zero mean, of course because we're just going to assume everything's zero mean, right? Now, and then instead of R, I'll put B. What is B called? It's the precision matrix, right? So, uh, okay, these are two different ways of looking at this, right? So how do I equate them? Well, I know that uh, the probability of x has got to be the probability of xn given xk for not equal to n, okay, times the probability of xk not equal to n, right? And if I take the log, I get that the log of p of x has got to equal the log of p of xn given xk not equal to n uh, plus the log of x of p of xk not equal to n. Okay? Well, now, if I differentiate, so if I differentiate this thing with respect to xn, I should blank this because I know that what happens is that if I don't blank it, this becomes very dark and it's hard to read. The log of P of Xn given Xk not equal to N, right? And you'd say, well, what about this term? 
Well, that term's not a function of xn. So if I differentiate that with 3 respect to xn, I get 0. So that has to be 0, right? So I have an equation here. I have an expression for this. I have an expression for that. I can set them equal and see what I find out, right? It's got to be something because this used a different parameterization. This was in terms of the g, the predictor, and sigma squared, which was the prediction error. And this was in terms of the precision matrix B. So if I differentiate this, this is going to tell me how the prediction errors and the, uh, the how the minimum mean square error predictor, non causal predictor, and the prediction variance is related to B, the precision matrix. So I get a relationship between them. If I do that, I'll let you go through the calculations. I get this, okay? Uh, so then I get this. So I get this. And what does this mean, of course? I get this is the matrix relationship, okay? So what does that mean? Okay, I'll. I have a few minutes. Let me try to explain it. Okay. Okay. What it tells you, okay, B is the precision matrix, right? So what does this tell you? It says that the, the diagonal entries of the precision matrix are the non-causal prediction variances or, or the reciprocal of the non-causal prediction variances. I'll say that one more time. Okay, what is sigma squared there? It's the non-causal prediction error variances, right? Non-causal prediction variances. So that means you predict non-causally, you have some prediction error. Whatever the variance of the error is, that's what sigma squared n is, right? In general, it's a function of n because it may not be the same. We're not necessarily assuming it's homogeneous right now. And it's saying those prediction variances are the reciprocal of the diagonal of the, of the uh, precision matrix. That was the same thing we did in that homework problem that I tried to do for you real quickly last time. Remember, the diagonal entries of B are the prediction variances, one over the prediction variances. Okay? Now, what's, then the next thing here, it says that you can also determine the non-causal prediction filter from B, you have to scale it, you have to take the entries of B, multiplying by sigma n squared, the prediction error variance, it's a variance. This is again that same problem. And that's correct, that gives you the prediction error except on the diagonal point, on the diagonal entry. Because you're not allowed to use <coughs> a pixel to predict itself, obviously, then you'd be perfect. My point is that, <coughs> excuse me, let, uh, we'll cover this next time, but let me just write it up on the blackboard. Hey, we didn't do too bad because we have three lectures for this, right? But I got through, I would say, at least half of it in one lecture. But you're going to read the notes, correct? So what ends up happening is that this matrix G is the non-causal prediction matrix. So it's got zeros on the diagonal because you can't use a pixel to predict itself. Obviously, that's cheating, okay? Then over here, you have like G, uh, Z, uh, G1, 1, G1, 2. Okay, these are all the prediction things. Here you have like G, N, N minus 1. This is G, 1, 1, or, or G, N, N. Okay, something like that. Okay, so these are the predict. These are the G's. G I J. These are the G's. Okay, this is the prediction matrix. So if you take X times G, you get X hat. X hat. That's those are non-causal predictors, predictions. Okay. If you take X minus. Uh, uh, G times X. This is the non-causal prediction errors, okay? So I can write that as I minus G times X, okay? 
if I take, now these, the expected value of epsilon times epsilon transpose, right, is going to be equal to a thing we're calling gamma. I think I call it gamma. Do I call it gamma? Well, this is what, I don't call it gamma inverse, right? Yeah, okay, I call it gamma. So this is a diagonal matrix, okay? Oh, no, that's wrong. Ah! Ignore what I just said here. Ah! Okay, was, that was totally false. The expected value of epsilon n squared. I should have never said that. It was horrible. I said exactly the wrong thing, okay? Like, purge that from your brain, okay? Is gamma n n. Gamma is the diagonal matrix, but it is not the covariance of epsilon because the thing that's going to be interesting about epsilon is it's not white, okay? When you have a causal predictor, the prediction errors are white. But when you have a non-causal prediction predictor, the prediction errors are not white because of the loopy dependency, okay? You know, like I'm dependent on you, but you're dependent on me. There's, we're all, it's all mixed up. You got some funny stuff going on, okay? And the prediction errors are now going to be correlated. But the gamma here represents, is a diagonal matrix which contains the prediction variances. So it's going to turn out that uh, using those calculations, which you're going to read carefully, right? It's going to turn out that B is equal to gamma inverse I minus G, okay? So what this means is if you look at the B, the precision matrix, you can see what the neighborhood dependency is. Because remember, G is zero any place you're not a neighbor, okay? You know, generally speaking, it's non-zero for neighbors. Or, you know, so if you look at the matrix B, you look at the non-zero entries, those are the neighbors. So what is going to end up happening when you look at B, it looks like this. Okay, we'll talk about it next time. You have entries along the, the diagonal. This will be like sigma, one squared. It's a precision matrix. So the diagonal entries represent the inverse prediction variance for the non-causal predictor. Then what will end up happening is you'll have stuff along here, and then this will be zero, and you'll have stuff along here. This will be zero, okay? The non-zero entries represent, by the way, matrices can be used to represent a graph, right? So if you have an input pixel and output pixel, the entry here represents the relationship between those two pixels. If the two pixels are neighbors, you'll have a non-zero entry here. If the two pixels are not neighbors, you will not, you'll have a zero entry, okay? So there's a problem in the homeworks which asks you to, about this, okay? I can ask that question in different kinds of silly ways. They're all exactly equivalent. But what will happen is if you try to memorize the answer and you don't understand what you're doing, I could just like turn the words around a little bit and you'll get it wrong. So that's how one way I check to see whether you really understood it, okay? But the key idea is very simple. If you, by the way, I am a big believer that if you're lazy, it's easier to understand things, okay? Because it's much easier to do these problems if you understand them. If you understand them, they're like simple. If you don't understand them and you just try to grind through it, they're hard, okay? So it pays to take a little bit longer to try to understand it. The idea is that you, the matrix structure here is that the, the places where it's zero, those pixels are not neighbors, okay? So you can see who the neighbors are. And we'll talk about this more next time, but I think we made pretty good progress on this chapter, okay? Great. Thanks a lot. See you on Wednesday. Bye.